Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Christensen with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, One Decade, Four Amendments, and the Transformation of America. The Newberry is an independent research library in Chicago with collections spanning more than six centuries of human history in Europe and the Americas. We have been free and open to the public since 1887. We recently reopened our doors to readers and visitors. You can visit our website, newberry.org, to make an appointment to do research in the reading rooms. Today's program is aligned with our current exhibit, Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy, which explores the presidential election of a century ago. You can drop by the library without an appointment, Tuesday through Friday afternoons to see it and our other fall exhibition, Renaissance Invention. The Rosenberg Bookshop at the Newberry is also open the same afternoons, and now you can always shop online at our website. For the safety of our community, our public programs currently remain virtual. Visit newberry.org to learn more about our many digital resources, online classes, and virtual public programs like this one. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. During the program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or the YouTube live stream. As time permits, our speakers will respond to your questions. Today's program is co-sponsored by the Carla Shearer Center for the Study of American Culture at the University of Chicago. It is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. Today's program looks at the decade of 1910 to 1920, when Americans dealt with economic and racial unrest at home on top of a world war and a global pandemic. Sounds sort of familiar. During that same period, the United States ratified four amendments to its constitution, ushering in the federal income tax, mandating direct election of U.S. Senators, prohibiting alcohol manufacturing and sales, and giving women throughout the U.S. the right to vote. These four amendments radically transformed American politics, culture, and everyday life, and set the stage for the 1920 presidential election. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, if you can all join me for a moment. Dr. Wendy Schiller is Professor of Political Science and of International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Dr. Lisa McGurr is Professor of History at Harvard University. And Dr. Kathleen Cahill is Associate Professor of History at Penn State. Please check the Zoom chat feed in a moment for links to the speakers' websites where you can read more about them. To start off, each of our speakers will give us a brief overview of the consequences of each of these amendments, beginning with Wendy. So Wendy, if you will take it away, please. Okay, thank you very much. It's a wonderful thing to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you. Uh, we're gonna show a slide deck sh soon. I'm happy to share that slide deck with you because as usual, I've put too many slides up because uh, I am so excited about the topic. So my job is to sort of explain the 16th and the 17th amendments. The 16th amendment is to institute um, a, an income tax, a more sweeping in, income tax than had been legislated prior uh, to that amendment. And the 17th amendment, which is really my academic specialty, which is the, um, the direct election of senators. So when you think about uh, the nature of uh, the adoption of a constitutional amendment, you always think, well, what spurs it? How long does it take to actually get through? Who are the who and what are the forces behind it? And you, what you have starting really earlier, but really in the 1890s, you get a, a form of economic populism. You get a form of expanded franchise, not necessarily to uh, voting for people of color, obviously, and women, but you get more and more white men uh, being recruited through party machines locally and other avenues to vote and to be engaged. 
And of course you have the, you know, the very, very wealthy uh, people who have made so much money during the industrial revolution uh, and, and the industrialization of the country spanning 75 years. But you get to a point where there are more people clamoring to be heard and to have their needs addressed than had ever been before. So there's a series of things that happens as background. And this is who I call the players of the game. In other words, you know, in, the, in the, the constitutional system, state legislatures, state legislators, and that means state legislators, selected uh, senators. There was no system that was mandated by the constitution and it got so out of control in terms of chaos, in terms of delay, in terms of corruption, that finally in 1866, the Congress passed a law that regulated the procedure uh, under which states would choose their senators, but it was still state legislators that was doing that. They each had to meet in their chambers, the House and the Senate, on the same day uh, after they came back into session, the second Tuesday, and they would come in, and if they chose a majority candidate, each of them, and that was the same candidate, that person would be certified the winner and be sent to Washington to represent the state as senator. But frequently, more frequently than anybody knows, about 30% of these elections between 1870 and 1913 ended up in a fight, essentially, between the people, the parties, uh, in between the parties opposing each other, but even the majority parties in a chamber, they didn't agree on the same candidate. And why? Because there were uh, regional parties that cared a great deal about maintaining control over who decided the senator to be chosen to go to Washington. This was about party strength. This was about regional divide within a majority party. Frequently it was super majorities. You know, everybody was at the same party, but everybody wanted a piece of the pot. They wanted to get their man, it was always a man, sent to Washington to represent their interests and overlay on that both state-based and national corporate interests. The sugar industry, for example, railroads, they got very involved in these elections. They would pay people to run for the state legislature. Then when the people were sworn in and started to think about voting for Senator, they'd pay them again to vote for the candidate that they preferred. And when a majority candidate did not appear, the two chambers met together uh, at noon, every day after that first day of balloting to decide the winner. So every day after that, there was bribery going on. There was cash paid in the morning, they'd vote. And then in the afternoon, they might have a hearing actually about the cash paid in the morning. There was tremendous coverage. People boasted about buying a Senate seat. And it was generally viewed by the time you get to the early 1900s as just uh, grossly corrupt and not representative of a growing populace that wanted more accurate representation. At the same time, a sense that the federal government would have to take on more responsibilities. And how would they pay for things? We start to get to a movement for child worker safety, for example. We, try, we get to a movement for broader and expanded education, for example. There are things that the federal government is supposed to do. We get involved, uh, we get closer to getting involved in international conflicts. So everything would require money. And where are we gonna get the money? This was a fundamental fight as when we adopted the constitution, certainly bringing us from the Articles of Confederation to the constitution, the power of taxation, the federal power of taxation, but the pressures to do more at the federal level, you know, bring about the income tax. So the movement, technically the movement for the income tax took longer actually than the ratification of the 17th amendment, but there are two pieces of the same puzzle. When you think about this, you think, okay, you're getting the public, getting more active, being recruited by progressives, the original progressives, and people who wanted uh, a break in the party stranglehold on these decisions and more accountability and more oversight of the powers they view to be elite, but not serving their own interests. So you want more from the federal government and you want a bigger say over how your tax dollars might be spent and responsiveness. So you can see where once the, the income tax amendment gained steam, then of course uh, the uh, 17th amendment for direct elections, which had been introduced by the way, for more than hundred years, but never went anywhere. They gained steam on the backs of this kind of movement of this kind of energy. And they're, addre they're supposed to address you know, the problems of the Senate and this corruption. And I, I'm gonna uh, finish up uh, by saying that, well, I won't ruin the punchline here, uh, but we can argue that with a $4.4 trillion federal budget uh, in uh, fiscal year 21 and um, estimated 
billion dollars being spent in this year's Senate contests alone. It's only uh, 25, uh, 35 Senate seats. Uh, a whole lot of money is being spent on Senate elections and a whole lot of money is being spent at the federal level. So whether these amendments did as they promised they would do is something I'm hoping that we can have a conversation about this afternoon. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Professor McGurr um, who takes the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy, that was fabulous. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to follow on, on your heels uh, to turn to talking about the 18th Amendment, uh, which uh, as you may well know, the 18th Amendment was the amendment that uh, outlawed the manufacture, the sale, the import, the export, and the transportation of intoxicating beverages from shore to shore. Uh, it was the, that was the first section of the amendment. The second section said that the states as well as the federal government would have pa concurrent power to enforce the law. Um, and uh, it was followed up by enforcement legislation, which stipulated that intoxicating beverages were 0.5% of alcoholic content, which made beer, wine, and all distilled liquors illegal in one fell swoop. So I think of the 18th Amendment as the amendment, or many think of it this way, I think, uh, the amendment of ill repute. It was an amendment that seemed to many Americans to go against the spirit of the Constitution, which many saw as protecting liberty and freedom and expanding democratic opportunities, just like the direct elections of senators had done, just like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to include, to expand, just like the 19th Amendment, as we will hear about in a little bit. But the 18th Amendment obviously sharply curbed individual freedom. And uh, I want to, I think because of the fact that it was so short-lived, because it was controversial, was rescinded in 1933 by the 21st Amendment, the only constitutional amendment to be rescinded. The fact that it was rescinded um, made it even more seem like an aberration, something that really didn't belong in the Constitution. And I think that has caused us to neglect many of the long-term consequences of the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment pushed the federal government in the direction of policing and surveillance it led to a vastly expanded role for the federal government in crime control. It reshaped all sorts of legal doctrine at the federal level. So it had a host of consequences. Uh, and I will touch on them briefly, but before I do, I just wanna explain how it is we got the 18th Amendment in the first place. How can one understand the coming of an amendment that so sharply curbed personal liberty? It came out of a hundred year old temperance movement. So it was long in the making in terms of the concern over intoxicating liquor and the problems of excessive drink, especially for women and children who were dependent on the family wage. So there's a long trajectory in history, but in the early 20th century, a moment as we are hearing today of constitutional activism more broadly, the <clears throat> warriors against liquor, against alcohol turn to the Constitution as a way of solving the problem of excessive drink. It would be a national solution and seemingly a permanent one. Uh, they do so because there's enormous anxieties in that period over mass immigration and the rise of the saloon is considered a new social problem. This leads to, in 1913, the introduction of the 18th Amendment to Congress. Um, and by the end of the war, toward the end of the war, in 1917, actually, when the United States, six months after it enters, the amendment passes and it's sent to the states. So World War I helps to put the constitutional amendment, the 18th Amendment, over the top. It does so because it's an atmosphere of conformity, concern over efficiency. Uh, the brewing industry is largely in the hands of German brewers, and we were obviously fighting the Kaiser at that time in World War I, uh, and that leads to the passage of the amendment. So what were the consequences? I mentioned a few of them at the start, uh, and I will just uh, mention a, a couple of more. Um, obviously, the federal government was intent on seeing, now that this amendment was passed, that it should succeed. It was now part of the living constitutional document of the nation, the founding document. Um, so there was a vast, as I mentioned, expansion of federal government authority, 
There was establishment of a new policing force at the federal level. Remember, the federal government is tiny at this point. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, as Professor Schiller pointed out, it is just beginning to expand. Folks are just turning to the federal government. But it's, it's small. This is the moment prior to the New Deal. So the Prohibition Amendment is a vast expansion of federal government authority. Um, and the federal government becomes involved in enforcement in a fundamentally new way. But it only enforces the amendment selectively. And that is because of the nature of black markets and the huge profits to be made uh, through the 18th Amendment. Um, so it's largely marginal violators and poor men and women that end up in the webs of prohibition enforcement at the local, state, and national level. This leads to a massive spike in prison numbers. In the 20s, there's a tripling of federal prison numbers. In the 30s, almost a doubling again. Uh, in the state level, prisons are hugely overcrowded. In Virginia, prison numbers double. In North Carolina, they triple. In Texas, prisons are so overcrowded uh, that there's a refusal to take any more prisoners uh, until there's an expansion of the prison system. So there is a, a sort of a vast expansion of incarceration, the first spike, something that we see again uh, in the 70s related to the war on drugs. Um, and there's a new role of the federal government in crime control. There's an obsession over crime in the 20s because crime becomes a, with organized crime rings to satisfy the thirst of Americans for alcoholic beverages, uh, a, a new national obsession. And federal gov the federal government uses this to build their own role in crime control. So by the late 20s, Herbert Hoover calls for a war on crime. Uh, there's establishment of uniform crime reports, a new large-scale national crime commission, an expanded role for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which of course becomes the new, the, the increasingly important policing force after the Prohibition Bureau fades. So the role, in other words, of the federal government in crime control far outlasts the 18th Amendment, as does its role in narcotics control. The 18th Amendment leads to a concern not over, not just over recreational drink and the problems of excessive alcohol consumption, but simultaneously a concern over the consumption of other forms of dangerous narcotics. Um, that's natural if you're outlawing something which was widely used and seen as dangerous to look at these other forms of drugs as well that folks were concerned with tipplers might turn to these now other forms of narcotics. So you also see a ratcheting up of the incarceration and new criminal approach and penal approach toward drug use that comes out of the alcohol prohibition years. So by 1930, we have the establishment of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and the first national drug czar. And after the end of alcohol prohibition, as soon when it becomes tarnished and rescinded, those officials turn toward new campaigns uh, against narcotic drugs. So the, there is enormous continuity, in other words, between what happens in the 1920s and the continued role of the federal government in policing and crime control and narcotics enforcement. So even though prohibition is rescinded, it has long-term consequences. Finally, I will end with another long-term consequence, which is political realignment. 1928, immigrant ethnic workers who were deeply, deeply not only hostile to the law, but experienced enormous amount of, uh, you know, essentially enforcement on their communities and also enforcement that, you know, breaking down of doors and citizen enforcement that were real grievances that pushed them into uh, national politics. Uh, many, often for the first time in 1928 when Al Smith ran on the banner of prohibition opposition. And so prohibition helped to build the base of the alignment, realignment of industrial ethnic immigrant workers to the Democratic Party that Franklin Roosevelt built on in 32 and 36 to create the social base of the New Deal. Another very long-term lasting consequence. I need to, I have to stop with that. There are other consequences that I could spend a long time explaining, but I obviously don't want to take up any more of, of the time. Um, but I am happy to discuss it in the Q&A. Thank you. And I will turn now the floor over to Professor, Professor Cahill. You're muted. <laughs> 
muted. Well, I was talking about how fantastic those presentations were. Uh, and thank you to my fellow presenters. Um, and I'm thrilled to be um, at the Newberry. Uh, it holds a very um, large place in my heart. I spent a lot of time there as grad student. Um, so Karen, could you uh, put up the PowerPoint slide, please? Okay, so um, the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress in June of 1919 and then ratified uh, with Tennessee being the 36th state to ratify it, making Tennessee what suffragists called the perfect 36. Um, and that was on August 18th, 1920. So as you may know, this is the centennial year of that amendment. Um, you can see the language here. That language was first introduced uh, to Congress in 1878, which brings me to the first point that I wanna make in this short presentation. And that's the connection between the 19th Amendment and the Reconstruction Amendments, but especially the 15th. Um, to be very brief about a very complicated history, as you likely know, uh, the former formal women's rights movement in the country grew up um, in tandem with the abolitionist movement uh, beginning in the antebellum period. And then uh, after the Civil War, the changes to citizenship and suffrage that were brought about by the three Reconstruction Amendments um, raised the hope that women's, uh, women would also receive uh, the right to vote in that post-Civil War era. But that was not to be, as the 14th Amendment introduced the word male into the Constitution for the first time, and then, as a result, the 15th Amendment uh, protected Black men's right to vote in 1870. So the question of whether or not to support the 15th Amendment um, split the suffrage movement for decades. And the 15th Amendment continued to have an impact on women's suffrage debates nationwide um, over the next several decades. And so it's important to note that this year, 2020, is the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment. So um, in response to the 16th Amendment um, and using the, or, sorry, in response to the 15th and using the language of the 15th Amendment, suffragists um, in the post uh, Civil War era proposed a 16th Amendment, which was again, first introduced in 1878 in Congress. And it's modeled on the language of the 15th. So, uh, the 15th Amendment said, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied um, on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Uh, suffragists said, on account of sex. So um, after this split in the suffrage movement over the question of race, um, the, the efforts and the energy of the movement for women's suffrage really shifted from a national amendment to a uh, focus on passing suffrage legislation at the state level. Um, and that is the case until 1913, when the idea of a constitutional amendment was reintroduced with a great deal of panache um, by Alice Paul, um, with the idea of throwing a huge national women's protest parade in Washington, DC, the weekend of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, right? So kind of upstaging Wilson. And that's the picture you see here from that parade in 1913. Um, so the question of race, as I mentioned, um, remains central. Um, and this parade's a good example. Alice Paul tries to uh, initially ignores black women's requests to participate, uh, then relents, but says the parade needs to be segregated. Um, and they have to march in the back, which they refuse to do, and they ultimately don't. But uh, her uh, and hesitation is entirely based around the fact that she didn't want to isolate Southern congressmen who really worried that the question of women's suffrage, even for white women, would reopen uh, the issue of black men's disenfranchisement that had been affected by the Jim Crow laws and violence um, in the American South. Um, so a great deal of uh, the resistance to women's suffrage was because it would bring this question up or that black women would be voting. And so again, looking at the language of the amendment itself, we need to remember that the 19th amendment does not enfranchise all women or even give women a right to vote. 
um, is not a positive right. It merely says that sex is not one of the categories that can be used uh, to disenfranchise a person. There are still many ways in which people could be disenfranchised. And so that brings me to the second point that I wanna focus on. A number of, well, the second point is the question of 1920, right? As an important date and the, and the 19th amendment. A number of women um, in the US had the right to vote before 1920, right? Those state by state campaigns had been especially successful in the American West. And a number of uh, Western states were full suffrage suffrage states. But many women also were not enfranchised by this amendment. So the 19th Amendment opens the right to vote for a very large number of American citizens, but it's not complete. So if we look beyond 1920, and sometimes to other amendments, we can see this in um, the way it works. So if we could get the next slide, please. Um, I, get to, I get to show off uh, a really fantastic document that's in the Newberry collections here. One group of people who remained disenfranchised after 1920 uh, were Native Americans. Um, a very large number of them were categorized as legal wards of the government and not citizens. Um, and so this is a chart that a Native suffragist, uh, Gertrude Bonin, also known as Kalasa, uh, this is a chart she used to illustrate her lectures that she gave after 1920, starting probably around 1921. Um, she uh, urged newly enfranchised white women to use their votes to uh, vote for US citizenship for native people. And we can talk in the Q&A about how that was not necessarily a universal desire among all native people, but, but, but it's Bonin's position. Um, in this chart, you can see she's emphasizing uh, the unfree position under the federal bureaucracy on the left with what we have, bureaucracy, um, and then what she wants, um, democracy and freedom, uh, including the right to vote and um, sort of uh, localized government on the right. Um, this doesn't happen uh, until 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act or the Schneider Act. And many native people, um, although they try to vote in the 1920s are disenfranchised pretty quickly after that. So it'd be interesting to talk about that 1928 election. Um, black women in the American South also remained disenfranchised as Southern states imposed uh, those same Jim Crow laws that had disenfranchised black men onto black women. And they also, as an, uh, Liette Gidlow has uh, demonstrated, created new laws like the all white primary uh, in response to the threat of black women voting. And so, as I said, um, and here I'm drawing on other scholars like Martha Jones, that we need to look beyond the 19th Amendment to other amendments um, and other laws. So the 24th Amendment um, in 1964 that abolished the poll tax or the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to see how much longer the struggle for voting rights uh, was for some women. So I'll stop there and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see if we can get um, Lisa as well. There we go. Thank all three of you. Those were really fascinating and you've brought up um, lots of really interesting connecting points between yourselves as well. Um, I have some questions from um, listeners. Um, we have a question from Noah who asks if there's any recognized connection between the 18th and 19th Amendment movement, um, the WCTU specifically, and the modern ACLU. I can, I can say yes, absolutely. The Women's Christian Temperance Union um, was hugely important in the suffrage movement. And in fact, when they endorse um, the idea of women's suffrage, it, it's when it really kind of goes mainstream. Um, and so that's, that's a really important connection between the two. In terms of uh, connections to the ACLU, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that Crystal Eastman, who's a, a major women's rights activist and suffragist, um, was one of the founders of the ACLU. Um, but she comes at it more from the women's peace movement 
angle and I'm not, uh, I can't necessarily speak as much to the Women's Christian Temperance Union, except that the women's peace movement was a very large um, movement as well. Professor McGurr, do you have uh, thoughts on that? Um, I mean, in terms of the ACLU, the linkage between that and the 19th Amendment, I'm not, I wasn't clear on the connection of the ACLU. I totally get the, the yes, the women and the prohibitionists and the 19th Amendment all linked. Those movements cannot be really in some ways separated, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, prohibition was a, a very gendered issue and the way that women thought they could advance their uh, goals was through suffrage. I mean, we need to be enfranchised in order to shut down the saloons, is what the WCTU is arguing. Um, so, you know, that is, there, there are 100% connections and vice versa. The, you know, the American Women's Suffrage Organization did not, they didn't take a stand, but Carrie Chapman Catt and many others that were leaders of that movement, 100% were behind prohibition. Definitely temperance, but often also prohibition because they saw it as a gender issue. The harm that was being done was harm to women and women were dependent on the family wage. Um, the ACLU, you know, only comes about actually really after 19, around 1919, 1920 takes off um, right around the time when suffrage is already kind of on its way. So I'm not quite clear on it if I misunderstand that part of the question. This is a question for all three of you really, and it is from Rob. Uh, and he asks, if you could discuss what it was about this period in particular that was so fruitful for constitutional activists, as a, especially since, you know, up until this point, we had only had a very few amendments to the constitution and most of them were right after the, the founding of the constitution or, or right after the civil war. You're, you're so muted. I can, um, so when you think about certainly the 17th Amendment and the, and the role that the movement for uh, outside political parties and for uh, direct involvement in politics uh, comes with, um, and Richard Benzel, a political scientist, also um, uh, does a lot of history, talks about the educational rates, the literacy rates, and sort of the explosion of literacy rates as you get into the early part of the 20th century and how people are living in more densely populated areas and they are getting better educated in some ways, particularly in the North and the Midwest. And from that, you uh, great, huge newspaper usage, huge amounts of sort of involvement by newspaper owners in politics, uh, similar to way back when the constitution was founded, but much more widespread, much more mass media based. And so you get the idea that you should have a political opinion and that you have a political interest that needs to be represented. So I see uh, that particular, those particular changes that are not necessarily political or institutional changes, pushing for a greater responsiveness and a greater sort of accountability and, and power over elected officials. And that manifests itself in the support for some of these amendments. Yeah, I mean, I also think there's a kind of a snowball effect for some of this. Why, you know, when you have the successful passage, for example, of the of the 16th uh, and 17th. Um, it's only in 1913, actually, that prohibition has turned to a strategy of going for a constitutional amendment, which is relatively late, given that suffragettes were trying for it already in the late 19th century. Why do they? Because they already, you know, they have sort of the basis of the fight for the direct election of senators, the fight for the income tax, and then the passage of the income tax. And that's the passage of the income tax, which actually snowballs an argument for we don't need the excise tax to pay for federal government expenses anymore. Now we have the income tax, so we can fight for a constitutional level for prohibition. So I think there's a building effect also that leads to a kind of snowballing. And of course, you know, it's just, I think, I don't know really how that begins the strategy to go for a constitutional level. When it does, a lot of reformers really uh, turn to adopt it. I would just add that, yeah, that there are these sort of moments where I agree, I think it becomes a strategy, people learn how to do it, um, and, and constitutional amendments kind of cluster. And it's worth mentioning, of course, that Alice Paul, in the wake of the 19th Amendment, then turns to the Equal Rights Amendment as her next step, right? So again, this sort of sense of we know how to do this, we have this machinery, 
um, across the nation's polit political machinery and so trying it again. Um, so yeah, absolutely agree with those points. Anyone else want to weigh, weigh in on that? Um, I have uh, lots of questions here. <laughs> Hold on one second. Um, there are a couple that are, uh, people are asking about how various uh, things that are going on in the society at the time influenced these movements for these constitutional amendments. So one is asking about anti-immigrant sentiment and how was this important for a prohibition and the women's vote, for example. Um, what was the impact of World War I on those two, those amendments? Um, could you talk a little bit about kind of these larger things that are going on in the, in the society? Um, I guess I can start with that because nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment is pretty critical to, uh, you know, the prohibition moment and the kind of tidal wave that helped to put it over the top. Um, so th they're very much connected. And I think what, how they're connected, this is a moment of, you know, the first wave, massive wave of immigration from 1880 to 1920. And we had about 20 million Americans arriving, or sorry, immigrants arriving on American shores. And, you know, they're coming with different cultural habits, you know, largely from Europe, but nonetheless, you know, sort of places, Catholic immigrants, Southern immigrants who bring wine and beer cultures. Um, and the temperance movement was way older and heavy liquor was very widespread in the 19th century. But by the end of the 19th century, temperance advocates, which is a really wide array of laboring folks and even African-American, many different groups supported temperance. They had tamped down on the problem of excessive drink. The excessive, the distilled liquor consumption per capita plummeted. But at the same moment, beer consumption rises exponentially. And there's a dramatic introduction of saloons into, into the cities. So there's an anxiety and concern about how these, how immigrants are transforming the nation and the saloon becomes a kind of catch-all for the problems that seem to be coming with urbanization and industrialization. Um, and I think there's a way in which, you know, I, I think uh, Professor Cahill can probably answer this better, but the, 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 there's a linkage obviously between the nativism and suffrage was that you want to empower Protestant white women, native born women, instead of these immigrant workers. And of course that then filters into the suffrage as well. Exactly. And I'll just piggyback on that, um, that from early on, right, the Seneca Falls um, meeting and the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, um, which is often seen as the starting point, though it's not, but it's seen as the starting point of the suffrage movement. Um, there's a line about how, um, you know, degraded men, immigrant and uh, native, uh, are able to vote, but educated white women cannot. So that is absolutely a strand um, in the suffrage movement throughout its history. Um, the the cla classist and um, nativist argument that, that native born white women should vote. Um, what's also really interesting is, um, you know, World War I, um, as well as that massive immigration of the late 19th century also um, change things quite a bit. So there's a scholar named Rachel Gunter and some other people who are writing about how um, up through 1919, a number of states at one point, 22 states had laws that non-citizen um, immigrants could vote if they had taken out sort of the what were called first papers and indicated that they planned to naturalize. So the vote was not necessarily tied to citizenship in the 19th century in the way that it is now. Um, and so through both the activities of uh, white women suffragists, um, who are also um, often, right, those temperance advocates, uh, who are vilifying um, immigrant men um, and advocating for native-born white women suffrage, but also the nativism of World War II, um, those uh, the connections between citizenship and suffrage really are much more firmly unified by the end of World War II. Um, so yeah, absolutely, both of those things are connected. So can I, and I just to add on top of that, going post to the post-World War moment, um, 
you know, the continuation of nativism, you, again, you see that meshing both in the coming, at least with the 18th Amendment of, of it, but also with the unfolding. So, you know, the, basically now it's part, the 18th Amendment is part of the constitution. It's, part, it's, it's the nation's founding document. So when many Americans continue to drink or are not observant there, and, you know, William Harding declares a, a, a crisis of observance uh, as a kind of humiliation for the nation. There are those evangelical white Protestants who had supported the passage that basically utilize, instrumentalize the 18th Amendment to target and attack those they are concerned about anyway, as not sort of uh, in line with what they consider 100% Americanism. So the 18th Amendment becomes a kind of utilized instrumentally as a kind of legal mechanism for groups like the Ku Klux Klan that grow exponentially in the 20s to, to serve as enforcement organizations. They essentially have a kind of legitimacy granted by the 18th Amendment to say, hey, if, if the federal government, the state government can't enforce this law, we will step up and, and, and we're bound by the constitution to uh, basically enforce the law. And so they became vigilante or citizen enforcers during the 1920s. targeting, of course, immigrant Catholics and other minorities as the drinkers, even though, you know, <laughs> plenty of evangelical white Protestants drank as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. So we, we hear a lot about constitutional amendments today, about constitutional amendments that should be passed, right? That we should do away with the electoral college or we should do this or that. Um, and so I think that people often look to constitutional amendments as a solution to fundamental flaws in our democracy, if you will. Um, and so I guess my question for all of you is, do we give too much weight to their ability to make positive changes? Are there, are there other ways that we should be thinking rather than changing the constitution? Well, I'll take this. I don't know if we can put up the slides now, but maybe we'll just leave it. But uh, I have a couple of slides where I show the distribution of prior experience of U.S. senators who are elected in the period of indirect elections between 1870 and 1913. And you get, you know, a good chunk, 43, 40 percent come from the House of Representatives or they were governors or they were judges, or some of them were private sector people, and a good share of them are incumbent senators that get reelected. When you compare that to today's distribution, you see only a small increase, maybe 53% of the Senate comes from the House now. And then they're former governors, they're judges, they're private citizens. So in, in terms of expanding the diversity of the United States Senate, in terms of prior background and responsiveness, I don't think the 17th Amendment did much until it was accompanied by, as Professor Cahill pointed out earlier, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, which certainly meant that um, expanded voices were represented in politics through the vote, which then ultimately, although it took a long time, produced people um, a more diverse uh, Senate. And of course, we only had two women in the United States Senate in 1986, for example, uh, and now we may or may not have 26 women after this election, but it's certainly taken a very long time to just to get half the percentage of the US population that's women in the Senate. So it hasn't accomplished that goal. The second point is money. And, and I think there was a question about Citizens United and rolling back direct elections. And there's two points here. One is the amount of money, as I mentioned, is man, you know, there's about 300 and $30 million spent in the Senate election cycle in, in the turn of the century, 1899, and now it's $1.6 billion. And they're about the same number of Senate elections. So the money is still flowing. And it's not even, um, you know, totally transparent. It was more transparent in those days. People took credit for the bribery. Now it's more hidden. So I think in that sense, it's not so much the money that has changed. It hasn't done much to stop the money, but it's certainly created alongside Citizens United an opportunity for people to contribute the money without any uh, transparency, without voters being able to know who's funding those ads we're all seeing digital and otherwise. And I think that uh, that has the power to consolidate elite influence over electoral outcomes because elites have the money and they're giving the money in huge, huge amounts. And it's very hard for the average voter to figure that out. It was frankly much easier to figure that out um, under the uh, indirect elections than direct elections. Yeah, I mean, you've uh, just alluded to it, but um, again, the, the Constitution doesn't have, doesn't grant US citizens the right to vote. 
Um, and the 19th Amendment and the 15th Amendment are merely saying ways in which you cannot restrict the right to vote, leaving open a lot of other ways, um, again, which some of which are addressed later, uh, mostly by the Voter Rights Act, but that, right, we saw the recent Supreme Court ruling, which really took the teeth out of that. So, um, you know, and and in some ways, those amendments may well have been written in those very, with that very particular reason in mind. Um, again, there are lots of groups of people that uh, Congress wasn't interested in enfranchising in 1920. So um, I do think that they don't always, they carry right, great hope, um, but they aren't always uh, meant to be that wide. And then of course are, uh, you know, can over time, um, the way they play out may be different than was expected. Uh, yeah, just to piggyback off of uh, uh, Professor Hale, that was exactly this idea of the unintended consequences or uh, they play out in ways that are unexpected. I think that is all true of probably every one of these amendments, probably no more true than with the 18th because that, you know, we got rid of it because it was so, controversial and so many unintended consequences, but there was hope. I think that same idea of hope, the hope for essentially the amendment being a panacea. Once it would be in the constitution, then of course, you know, Americans would obey it because it's the rule of law. Um, and that of course was a completely misplaced um, and uh, led to all sorts of unintended consequences. Um, yeah, so I think actually with the 18th Amendment, in fact, I think that officials who wanted to uh, embrace a penal and punitive approach toward recreational substances, which they did subsequently with narcotic drugs, in marijuana in 37 and lots of other drugs, cocaine in the 20s and along the way, just essentially went for a different strategy. They realized this was great. This wasn't the best way to do this, too controversial. You know, it shouldn't be in the Constitution. We should legislate and have the states very much involved. The federal government should take the lead in establishing the schedules and having a Bureau of Narcotics, and we should involve the states uh, in enforcement. Um, and that, that actually was much more long lasting and a much better strategy in that case uh, in particular. Wow. <laughs> um, Beatrix has asked an interesting question. She says, has there ever been proposals for a constitutional amendment for a positive right to vote. And do you think that would be a good idea to work for such an amendment or would it distract from other methods of guaranteeing and expanding voting rights? Uh, that's a good question. I don't believe there has been, but if my fellow panelists um, no, otherwise I'm happy to hear about it. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, cause I, when I talk about the 19th amendment, I get asked a lot about the ERA. Um, and over the course of this year in particular though, really for the last couple of years, um, I've thought, well, we don't need an ERA. We need a voting rights amendment. Um, but after right hearing the responses here about our amendments, the best way to do this, I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of bunting it. I don't know, but it has certainly crossed my mind and I think it would be useful. Well, we might have to, I mean, we'd have to think about this, but, you know, states shall regulate the time, manner, and place or time, place, and manner. I always mess that up. But that's, to me, to me, that was the single, not the single, slavery, of course, is the most egregious uh, flaw in the Constitution, but that's a pretty big flaw. You know, giving states the power over everything, ballot access, polling access, voting requirements, signatures, it just created uh, inequality. And, and it was a tool to be able to suppress voting and it still is. So I think that to me is something that would have to be changed. Not a new amendment to guarantee a right to vote. Just take it out of the power of the states to do such different things. Why should I make me harder to vote in one state and easier to another? It makes no sense at all. It makes perfect sense, actually, though, because the second point is <laughs> politicians like to be certain about who is voting. 
They like to have the audience defined, particularly if they're incumbents and incumbents are the ones that run the rules unless you have independent commissions. So they make the rules. They like an identified voting populace. They do not want 100% turnout. They don't like uncertainty. So until we take it out of the hands of people who are elected, it's gonna be very hard to give them the incentive to expand um, to voting to where we hope it will be. Can, can that be done legislatively? Uh, legislatively, no. I mean, you run into, you can you can give them money, which is what Congress did, right? They passed $440 million for election security this year. And they kept saying, oh, and motor voter, where, you know, if you want transportation money, you have to make sure that people can register to vote in the motor vehicle department of their, of their state. So you can do incentives, but you can't, unless you undo that clause in the constitution, you can't, I don't think, override, except for the Voting Rights Act, you can't override their basic fundamental power to structure elections. And it doesn't even have to be an incentive to discriminate against a particular class of people. It has to be just the fact that they are willing to make it harder to vote in general. And I think that's a very hard thing for Congress to address. So we're, we're almost at the end of our time. I just would like to ask each of you if you have something you would like to leave us with that connects um, the history of what was going on in the United States and with these amendments 100 years ago with the present and the future. We have a whole bunch of questions asking various things about that. So I thought I would just sort of toss that out to you. You know, we've sort of been discussing this. So I'll just very briefly say, right, it's 2020. It is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, and we are faced with a great deal of voter suppression and disenfranchisement. Um, so these, right, this is not something that was in the past. Um, this is not even something that was solved by the civil rights movement. Uh, we continue to live with this and, um, you know, should be inspired by the people who fought for it in the past, but recognize that we're still having to, to be vigilant. I'll go next really quickly. I'll just uh, write off of, of that uh, by Professor Cahill, which is that what I'm impressed by is how quickly women, it seems not quick, you know, 100 years, but how quickly women have become this incredibly crucial voting block. And women uh, from all ethnicities, races, religions, uh, economic backgrounds, women, women, women. And the idea that uh, presidential elections, Senate elections, House elections, state elections, and women governors thinking that women, things depend on women, and that policies um, may go in one direction or another from the judicial system, and then how the society reacts will reflect the power of women. And so to that extent, I think that is something to be thought of as a success associated uh, with the 19th Amendment. Um, okay, I guess I will say just a word about the way in which I think uh, it's also 1920, of course, is the 100th anniversary of the actual coming of, of prohibition, the actual sort of when it became law of the land. Um, and I think, you know, I, there's, a, there's huge lessons to be learned from looking back at that moment for the contemporary present, which is I mentioned the spikes in incarceration. I mentioned the sort of shift to a kind of criminal penal approach for drugs. Obviously, that has driven the United States in the more recent, more successful, and longer lasting war on drugs to become the nation with uh, more of its citizens behind bars proportionally than any other country in the world, which means that we're in a huge crisis that is not visible to all Americans, but, but to many that live close to the communities that are involved and, 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 and suffer the punitive consequences. So, you know, I think what this teaches us for today is that all kind of penal and punitive approaches for any kind of recreational substance are problematic. And I think we need to think about harm reduction. Um, the other, I guess, point about, you know, how prohibition suggests something about today, this was a moment of hugely heightened nativism. So in a more optimistic note, I suppose, there was also a counter response, right? I mean, we see a lot of patterns from the 20s, nativism, the Klan arising, gaining power, um, uh, throughout the nation at the same attacks and real terror on, on immigrant communities and other minority communities. But there's a counter response. And by 28, a new sense of enfranchisement of those groups. And by 32, they become newly part of this new coalition and empowered throughout the 20th century, at least ethnic white immigrants. 
So I do think there's a hopeful note in that, you know, we're in 2020, we're in another moment of heightened nativism and uh, as uh, uh, Kathleen pointed out also voter suppression. Um, but there are also mobilizations and opportunities. And I, you know, we're coming up on an election on November 3rd, and I certainly hope that is going to be possibly reflected in the amount of voter turnout and transformation we might or might not witness next week. Well, thank all three of you so much. You've given us so much to think about, and, and I appreciate uh, you ending on a, a note of hope. That's very, <laughs> that's very much appreciated in these days, I, I think. So thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your, your research and your, your uh, insights with us tonight. Um, I also would like to thank again, the sponsor of today's discussion, the Carla Scherer Center for the Study of American Culture. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. A recording of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel in a few days. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of our entire community. Please support the Newberry Library by making a gift online at newberry.org give. You also can see the exhibit, Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy at the Newberry through November 25th. We look forward to welcoming visitors back to events at the Newberry as well, as soon as it's safe to do so. In the meantime, please join us for our next virtual program this Friday, October 30th at 12 noon central time. It's called Astrolabes and Armillary Spheres, Scientific Instruments and Prints in the Renaissance. That program is aligned with one of our current exhibitions on view at the library, Renaissance Invention. You can register for this and other programs on our website, newberry.org. Thank you.